next week is Jonathan Watson. We will talk about Pro Hicks Dynamics versus Dynamics because we have <coughs> some very something very interesting to say about it. So it's something new. Thank you. I, I admire your optimism. I'll, I'll attempt to have something interesting to say. It's, it's great to uh, be at FOSDEM again and uh, to see such a, uh, a full room. Who was, who was here last year for my session? Just out of curiosity. Okay, I didn't scare everyone off who came last year. That's, that's some <laughs> achievement at least, okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Jonathan. I like cold places. This is my vacation on a glacier. It was, it was cool. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So uh, I am one of the folks who works on the, uh, the Pelsix compiler stuff, which means that uh, in many ways, I'm one of the folks who probably is gonna get lynched if we don't actually cut 6.0 this year. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm developing plans for where I can go into hiding and all of these things. But uh, actually, yeah, plan, plan, plan. That's, that's, that's a good advice. Yeah, no, shave. but plan, shave, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shaving would probably also work. The primary plan is actually to deliver Pearl 6. Um, anyway, uh, so um, I'm, I work a lot on the, of course, the Pearl 6 compiler um, and uh, the more VM uh, runtime. I, I also do some, some other uh, bits of work. Um, in many ways, I, I guess I'm a bit of a language polyglot uh, in the programming language sense. And uh, if I, I actually, when I was preparing this talk, I sort of thought back over the last year what languages did I actually deliver code in that people used? And I realized it was a little bit of a list. And uh, people actually even paid me to do some of these. Um, I actually wrote JavaScript without getting paid for it. That's, that's kind of something. Um, yeah. So no, it was because I was writing the UI for the Pelsix profiler. And uh, it's really, really slow because I didn't want to learn JavaScript, so I used AngularJS. Um, so it looks beautiful, and it works really slow. So uh, yeah. Anyway, um, if I uh, take these languages, and uh, I was to do a little survey, okay, of uh, whether people would call them static or dynamic, I think I would probably get answers like this. Okay. Anyone want to heckle? Disagree? <laughs> no. Okay. So um, even though these terms are to me very woolly, not very well defined. Uh, we tend to sort of be pretty good at uh, putting languages into what, uh, one camp or the other. And uh, having uh, worked with you know, these languages over the, the last year, um, I can say that uh, they have benefits and drawbacks and they've been debated plenty and I don't really plan to, uh, to add fuel to that fire. Um, but I can say that I felt the pleasure and pain that comes from both sides. And uh, I'm not really here to talk about what's best. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of places on the internet you can go and do that, okay? Uh, just, just search for is static better than dynamic and is dynamic better than static and you will have, you know, weeks and weeks of stuff to read. Um, however, um, what I do like is uh, the times when I can sort of have my cake and eat it, okay? And uh, one of the things that excites me about Perl 6 is it feels to me like one of those languages where a lot of the design calls that have been made and uh, a lot of the things we have kind of are putting us a bit into this kind of position. So uh, let's start out writing uh, a little bit of code. I'm only gonna do a few uh, small examples in different languages, okay? So uh, this is uh, hopefully kind of easy code. Um, we uh, declare a variable, we uh, assign something into it, we uh, do some bit of IO, we have a load of crappy boilerplate around it. Um, what is this going to do? And where, when, when, what's going to fail? The, it's going to fail to compile, okay? The C Sharp compiler is going to say the name moroning <laughs> doesn't exist in the current context, okay? And, uh, well, fine. So, uh, so it's another day and I'm writing Python, so Ruby is about to say, actually when you start looking at comparative bits of code, sometimes you realize it's really easy to be a programming polyglot, okay? <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> But uh, what, what are these going to do? Ah. <laughs> ah. Does anybody know? Oh, I hear we're thinking about it a bit. <laughs> they might fail. Yeah. Any other suggestions? 
Printing what? Print undefined. It, might, it will fail, someone says. Yeah. So actually, um, um, when will it fail? Runtime. Runtime. Bingo. OK. Looks like that. So uh, this, this, is, this is almost sort of you know, what I call sort of reckless dynamism. <laughs> um, it's, it's kind of the, the sort of thing where we, you know, we, uh, we really put stuff off until, uh, until runtime. And uh, of course, if uh, we, we take vanilla Perl 5 and we feed a similar program in, then uh, we're going to get uh, kind of the, the same. Um, and uh, of course, we don't do that. We put use strict on the top, OK, and it tells us a compile time. So uh, here's a, an unadorned, without any use strict Perl 6 program. What is this one going to do? It's going to print opening hours and then crash. OK, that's one idea. Anyone else? It fails during compilation. But it's Perl 6. <laughs> Read the slide, man. <laughs> yep. Yep. So what happens if I feed this to Perl 6? It fails during compile, OK? And I mean, seriously, what the heck? Look at this thing. It said sorry for my moronic typo. I mean, it's almost Canadian levels of polite here. <laughs> and, and then not only did it say it was sorry and that I screwed up, it went and looked at what variables I did declare. And it said, oh, maybe you meant morning instead of morning. Yeah, I probably did. And uh, just to sort of help me out a bit, because maybe this happened inside a nice long line of code, it has a, a little sort of green red thing, OK? And it sort of says, I was happily passing, and it was good, and I was happy, and then I ejected here, OK? It's the eject symbol from an old cassette player. Um, and uh, everything beyond it was sad and red, OK? So uh, it points out exactly where on that line the problem was. Well, that's kind of nice. And uh, this is just one of many, many examples that I'm going to show you today, where in Perl 6 we've thought very carefully about what sort of things it's possible to know and complain about at compile time, what sorts of things we really should make very dynamic and leave unresolved until runtime, and then for all of those ones that we, by default, will tell you about at compile time, we sort of also provide you a little escape valve <coughs> if you really, really need it, OK? So, one of the things that has been really um, sort of coming back to us again and again uh, throughout the Perl 6 design and implementation process is just how valuable lexical scoping is. What do I mean by lexical scoping? Well, it's just a fancy word for saying thingies between curly braces are a scope. And anything that you declare inside of them with my lasts until the closing curly, OK? So uh, in here, you can see I've got that little green scope. On the outside, I've got this, this uh, purpley one. OK, and at the end of this purple one, then uh, we, uh, you know, we, we got rid of some now. We got rid of average. We can't talk about them anymore. OK? So it's not just variables, though. No, uh, it's it not only you know, by default declared lexically with my and resolved lexically, but it's, uh, it's also subroutines. So in Perl 6, when you write sub, abbreviate there, what you're actually kind of saying, really, if you wanted to put it in Perl 5 terms, is my sub abbreviate. And we haven't just made sub declaration lexical. We've made sub resolution lex lexical. So what happens is when you call a subroutine, we go and we look for it in the current lexical scope. And if we don't find it, at the end, we come back to you and you say, by the way, um, you used this uh, abbreviate, uh, spelt in a kind of abbreviated way, uh, at line six there. Um, did you mean abbreviate spelt properly? OK. <coughs> so this is just another place where by saying, well, subroutines are you know, lexical by default. We'll look them up as lexicals. We get a whole lot of ability to point stuff out at compile time. Now, you might at this point have some objections, like, how do I do x? OK, and we'll come to those in just a moment. 
Now, staying on this example, though, there's a few more things that uh, could go wrong. I mean, if I'm having a bad day, I'll typo things. But if I'm having a really bad day, I'll forget one of the arguments, okay? And uh, because we can actually resolve, as we compile this program, what you're calling, we can take a look at this call. And we can say, wait a minute, you're passing a, a single argument there. But up here, this sub, it has a signature that says it wants two. We're going to tell you about that at compile time in this case, because we can. There's no point letting. Sorry? I forgot to put the what back where? Did I really? <laughs> that was bad of me. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> um, you, you actually get a load of them back. It collects them. So we, we classify it to uh, parse errors and compile errors into two categories. We have panics and we have sorries. Now we say we're sorry about all of them because just shouting panic would be really, really bad, okay? What we uh, do inside the compiler though is we actually distinguish them and panics means we were passing the program but we can't possibly go any further because we're too confused and we'll just start spewing meaningless errors trying to guess. But in other cases, we spot a problem and we're like, this is definitely a problem. We won't compile the program, but we're still in a good state and we can keep passing. And we actually distinguish them, okay? And we don't actually stop collecting errors until we hit something that's a panic. So it, it's kind of a nice trade-off between the two, okay? Because I've seen cases where, I love this with C compilers, okay? I make one little mistake and I get 100 errors for it. And it's like, come on, show me the first one. So I can actually even take that one step further because uh, let's put in some types, okay? So uh, there's a string. That's got to be an int. What's that going to happen now? Well, it can actually even look at this and it can tell me, you know, that's definitely an int. I can see it. It's a literal, okay? It's really obvious to me as a compiler. And it's really obvious to me this is a string as well. So your program is never possibly ever going to work, okay? There is no way you can ever make this subroutine call and have it work at runtime, no matter what you do. This, this is just never ever going to happen. And we can point that out. Now, there's only so many cases we can point this out so far, okay? We don't do a lot of crazy inference. And we actually, we're being very careful about this because this, in this case, we can explain to you what's going on, okay? We can say you called it with an int and a string and it wants a string and an int and you can go and look at it and you can say, oh yeah, I did. Um, what we do not want to do is get to the point where we spit out this huge sort of massive mathematical proof we did of why your program won't work and then you sort of look at it and you're like, I better get a PhD before I do class six, okay? So that's, that's not the goal. So we're trying to sort of balance out um, telling you stuff without sort of going overboard and being able to understand, you know, what we're, we're actually uh, saying. But for this one, we catch it. Little curiosity for you, by the way, you might be curious, anyone, can anyone guess what bit of the compiler actually uh, figures this out? You know, <laughs> you know you work on the compiler. <laughs> That's cheating. It's actually the optimizer. Um, it's kind of, and that sounds really weird, but the optimizer is trying to prove properties about your program um, that help it to optimize it. And occasionally, as it does so, it proves your program could never actually work as a side effect, okay? So uh, we kind of get two for one there. I like that. Now, I said that this is all a product of lexical scoping, but I, I kind of only told half the story. Because what's really going on here is that uh, those subroutines that you add and those, uh, those variables you declare, of course they, they exist at runtime, but they also sort of come into being at compile time as we compile your program. And that is why by the time we get to the end of the, the load of code you've written, we can start reasoning about it. So whenever I see a line of code like that, okay, that is uh, take a, an array of uh, readings and uh, 
the plus there is the, the reduction measure op, okay? It's like putting plus between all the array elements and uh, you get the sum out the end. What we actually do is we kind of break that into two things. We say, well, you've done a declaration, okay? That is, you have said that uh, in this scope there exists a variable sum and uh, that is uh, something that we'll need a bit of space for at runtime as well. And then at runtime, of course, we make every time you enter the scope some space to store that variable and uh, we run the assignment at the place you wrote it. But all the time when we do these things, we're sort of picking the two apart and saying, well, what does the compiler need to know and what's gonna go on at runtime? Okay, so declarations in Perl 6 are very much a compile time thing. Just as a historical aside, um, this idea of you know compile time, runtime, and objects that sort of exist at compile time, sort of going over to runtime, was uh, one of those things that uh, really took me a quite a while to get to terms with. Because when you go off to compiler school, okay, well, computer science classes, um, you go off to your compiler class, and uh, they sort of teach you that there's a compiler which does all the work at compile time and spits out a program. And there's an interpreter which sort of chugs its way through uh, code. Um, and uh, you know, what you kind of understand a lot less out of that is sort of all the possible shades of gray between. Um, when I teach software architecture, I often show my, uh, my students a graph like this. This is the ignorance graph, okay? It's the idea that when you start at working on something, you're at a point of maximum ignorance about it. And over time, hopefully, it decreases. And a lot of the time in a project, you kind of have a sort of aha moment where you understand something about the very core of the problem you're solving. And uh, for me, with the Perl 6 compiler stuff, actually this, uh, this sort of compile time, runtime boundary stuff was one of those things where I kind of realized, aha, that's the reason that so much of our code in the compiler is really convoluted. Back then, if you actually wanted to you know, just take a symbol that was gonna exist at compile time and try and set it up at runtime, we solved it ad hoc every way. And it wasn't until I realized that's a really common thing. That happens all the time. Um, and of course, th nowadays, that's, that's a one-liner in the compiler. And it was one of those, those places where uh, you know, it was a very much a, a lesson learned. Um, now, okay, let's talk about classes. So classes are also declarations. And uh, that means that uh, when we write the class keyword and uh, we start, writing methods in there and adding uh, attributes in there, stuff starts to exist at compile time. And that provides us with a whole load of quite interesting opportunities. So uh, let's talk a bit about method calls before we do that because that's, that's kind of one of the reasons you write a class, okay, to end up calling the methods on it, that's kind of the point. So this is one of the things that in Perl 6 is late bound. Okay, these are things that are resolved at runtime. It's completely up to the object that receives the method call to decide how it's going to handle it. And that's very much in the spirit of the way that, you know, OO works. So, you know, if I'd write something like this, okay, this, this is a runtime error. You can tell because we're not sorry about it, okay? You laugh, but it's a really good visual hint. Okay, you'll get, you get very used to this when you're writing Perl 6. If it says sorry up there, you know the compiler is telling you. Okay, if it's not there, you know you made it till runtime. It's one of those things that after a while you, you just take for granted and it helps you understand, you know, what do I need to do. Uh, now, you know, in this case, okay, we have a class, we have three fields, okay, and uh, we, uh, we go, we make an instance of it. We call uh, a method that doesn't exist, okay, that's, that's clearly a, a runtime error. Now. That, uh, that object there, of course, you know, it, it has a fairly fixed set of methods it could handle, but uh, we're very, very dynamic about the whole method thing. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do. And uh, you know, one of the easiest mechanisms we provide for this is the magical fallback method. Another general design rule in Perl 6 is if something is an uppercase, it's something that Perl will call for you in some kind of circumstance. And uh, fallback is one of these. So we can write a, a horrible little HTML producing class here, okay? And uh, what I do is I say HTML.p, and it goes off and it tries to call a p method on this class, and it, the class is like, I don't know how to p. 
So uh, what then happened, that came out bad, didn't it? <laughs> I <laughs> okay, so <laughs> at least you remember the example. So uh, what happens is we end up in fallback, and the first thing that we get is passed the name of the method we tried to call, and then we get passed the arguments that we tried to call it with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slurp all of the uh, positional ones up into an array. I'm going to slurp all of the, uh, the named ones up into a hash. And uh, then I'm going to do some horrible string munging and uh, produce a bit of HTML. And you can see that, uh, OK, in this uh, case, uh, the P tag is getting three children. OK? And uh, for the A tag, we've used a, a named argument there to uh, get the attribute in. OK? And of course, don't actually do this. Uh, without going and hooking it up to something that knows how to HTML encode content, otherwise you'll get a wonderful cross-site scripting bug. Um, but uh, you know, it, it kind of shows the idea that you know an object is very much in control of the destiny uh, of the method calls that head its way, and uh, this is just one way of being able to sort of decide what to do with your method calls that uh, you know you can't actually handle. So we make method calling a very sort of dynamic thing. And we, one of the ways we actually thought about that in Telfix is linguistically. We tend to consider a lexical scope as being your language. It's the language you as a programmer are writing in. And when you declare things in there, you're adding words into your language that you can use and speak with. So when we make, you may. When using new? No, because there is a new method because you inherited it. No, I mean when you have when you define new, normally it will do uh, fetch. Yes, it doesn't though. Okay. It actually assigns to the attributes correctly. Okay. Yeah, so so no, um, not in that case. <coughs> yeah, um, so, so yeah, the method has to not exist in any of your base classes. Um, but yeah, the way new works is it actually assigns to the attributes, not calling their setters. So, yeah. OK. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the general principle is you know, lexical scoping is all about your language. OK? And you choose what you import into it. Uh, you choose what you declare there. And you know, it's, it's something you're, you're very much in control of. And this is, a, again, a very general Telfix principle. We always know what language we're in. So you know, if you declare a new operator or you import a module, that does add new operators into the language, well, that's just fine. But at the end of that lexical scope, the parser isn't going to recognize them anymore. Okay, We keep all of these things very lexically constrained. But when you're talking about an object, the idea of objects is they're a point of decoupling. They're a point of inversion of control where you say, you know, I want you to do this thing, and you know, I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm not going to define how you're going to do it. But you know, let's you know. Here, here's something I'd like you to do, and it's it's up to the object to interpret what the words you tell it in the method calls actually mean. Um, and that's you know that's that's a lot of the power of uh, of, of objects. Um, they're very autonomous in that way. So method calls are one of the things about classes that you know inherently we we really want to leave as a very dynamic thing. But there's a few other things in classes that. Uh, you know, maybe are a little bit more lexical that we can figure out by looking at what's between the opening curly and the closing one. So, uh, what is this one going to do? Uh, yeah, that's a compile time fail. Okay, it's going to say the attribute start here ain't declared in class more. Okay, and uh, how about this one? Yeah, compile time fail again, OK? Because uh, this time it actually also goes, and uh, this is quite a, uh, it's, it's sort of a common-ish mistake. I don't make it that often, but uh, you know, it gets made now and then. And that is forgetting the, the twiddle, OK? That, that, uh, that exclamation mark there that says, this is a, actually a, an attribute of the class I'm interested in. And uh, what you've actually got there is just a normal lexical lookup. And uh, we actually catch it, and then we actually go, and uh, when we catch these and we're inside a class, we go and check what attributes the class has and say, is the one that matches? 
and uh, forget it, if so. Because uh, it, it, it's one of those ones that people pit up enough, enough on that it's, it's just kind of nice to point it out. So, uh, and this is one of the advantages of the, uh, the Perl6 compiler being written in you know, Perl6. Um, this, feat, this actual error message edition was contributed about one month ago by someone who tripped up over this too many times and was like, damn it, I'm going to patch the compiler. So, and we do pretty much the same for private methods too, okay? So a private method is a method that you can call uh, anywhere in the, uh, the scope of this class. Um, if you want to call it from further out elsewhere, you can tell uh, that your class trusts another class, but don't do that, okay? Um, so uh, what I've got here is, you know, I decided to refactor my code, so I wrote a little, uh, a, a little private method. You can see the exclamation mark there. Tells you it's private, okay? I've called it date range, and it just makes a range from the start year to the end year. And uh, then I want to call that private method, okay, with the exclamation mark, and I, uh, I uh, you know, go and uh, smart match it against the year. And it uh, checks if that falls within the range. And of course, uh, you know, you can see what I've done here. I've gone and uh, called a method that they didn't have, and again, it can come back to me at compile time, okay, because these are non-virtual, and it can say, oh, you misnamed that, uh, that private method when you called it, okay? So all, all of these things uh, where we've made them, you know, kind of lexical, we have a, a very good opportunity to tell you about at compile time. And that includes roles, okay? So if you get uh, two roles and uh, they're going to provide something to the class that is in conflict, when do we actually compose the roles? Well, we, we compose them when we hit the closing curly brace of your class declaration. That's the actual composition point. So as soon as we hit that point, we say, okay, let's compose the roles into the class. And then, you know, if anything's wrong, it's an error. So uh, just to look at an example, okay, we're building a little system for our friends who collect old books and rents them out. So uh, here I have a, uh, an old book for rent. Okay, it does borrowable. So you can see that uh, we can uh, lend it out for a certain duration. It's going to cost a certain amount to borrow it. And uh, then it's uh, collectible. So we know whether it's a first edition and whether it's in fine condition. Okay. So um, that's fine until one day, uh, you know, we, uh, we get asked to change the system. And we're told that, uh, yeah, actually these jerk people who borrow our books don't ever return them in time. So we want to start fining them. <laughs> All right. So we add a, a fine here. So uh, does anyone spot the, the problem? Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, if you do that, Perl6 is going to, uh, to actually complain at you. In fact, I think I've chopped the second half of that error message off, um, which told you where it came from. So just I have to ruin my slide. Okay. But the, the thing you've been told there is that actually the, uh, the two attributes you declared there are in conflict. And we'll, we'll tell you about methods that are in conflict. That's still a normal thing. Um, but uh, if we'd done this with, say, multiple inheritance, what would have happened? Well, no error. And because it just turned out that uh, completely arbitrarily, you know, I, I just thought of borrowable before collectible, okay, I would just have got the new behavior I put in there overriding the, uh, the original one I had. No warning, okay, no... No heads up, you know, system goes off into production, weird things happen, okay? So this is another place where, you know, at compile time, we can give you that extra bit of safety. So what we're trying to do here is, you know, balance out that, you know, that very flexible method dispatch where you can do pretty much whatever you like um, with this, this sort of uh, very, you know, large bunch of checking where we can point out things that you almost certainly didn't mean uh, or that are never actually going to work. Modules give you some interesting opportunities because uh, when we hit a use statement, we actually go off and load the module right away. What that means is that uh, at this point, the module actually gets a chance to do some stuff. And it gets to do, so do that stuff in the context of the compilation of the bit of code that is going to do the use. 
The other thing that we've done in keeping with all of the lexical default in Perl 6 is we've made imports lexical by default. What that means is that if I have some curly braces there and I say use test, okay, and I do plan 42, okay, and then I close it and I try and say not okay, it's going to come back and say, oh, that's an undeclared routine, okay, because we imported the stuff we needed just into one scope, and after that scope's gone, okay, it's, it's the symbols are gone. And uh, you can just actually import bits where you need them now. Uh, you don't have to sort of, uh, you know, do them all at the top of the file. You can, you can scope these imports much more to the places that actually want them. Now, you might wonder, you know, um, how can we um, sort of, uh, you know, do some slightly more dynamic things where we'd like to generate subroutines? And there's, there's various ways, but modules are one of the really good ones. So uh, let's just write ourselves a little module. I've called it uh, shell as sub, okay? When it's just a little module where I, uh, I name a couple of shell commands, ping and trace root, and uh, what I actually get is a couple of subroutines where I can uh, just call the commands just by calling the subs, okay? Now, uh, that's a module, okay? It's a lot of code. So uh, what we do is we write a sub export, and the uh, the importer actually calls this when we use the module, and it says, uh, "Here are the things you can see there in commands that we actually would like to uh, uh, to sort of have, and uh, we get to interpret that however we want." And all we need to do is return a hash of the symbols that we want to have installed into the lexical scope of the thing that's doing the importing. So all I need to do is loop over the command create this little anonymous subroutine and that takes some arguments, okay, runs the command, flattens that argument list in there, and then we'll just install it in this hash, stick an ampersand on the start because that's the way subs are installed, and uh, return it. We're done, okay? And that, that's it. So the really nice thing about this is that I've just very dynamically gone and generated and uh, produced these subroutines on demand but uh, what happens if I, you know, I take the, uh, the one that I've created there and then I, you know, I spell it all the way out as trace root, like, you know, a sane operating system that isn't Windows would do. <laughs> What's going to happen? Well, I get told at compile time, okay? It actually tells me here, trace root use, okay, did you mean trace RT? Okay, and you might be saying, why is it line one? And the answer is I did it in a minus E, and then when I put it on the slide, I put in a line break, okay? So I beat you to asking me that time. <laughs> it's not a compiler book slug. Okay, so uh, that's, that's kind of neat. And you can actually do that sort of thing with classes too. So I told you that, uh, you know, when we encounter a class, we make a declaration. What do they really mean by that? What I mean is we go and we actually construct an object that represents that class. And when we hit a method, we construct an object representing that method. When we get an attribute, we construct an object representing that attribute, okay? And for all of these things, um, really what the compiler is doing is it's just producing objects for you that describe the declarations you're making. Now, occasionally, some of us like to sort of sound fancy and clever, and uh, we call these objects meta objects. Okay, but that's all they are. They're just objects that describe something in your program. That's all a meta object is. Now, how can we write a module that dynamically produces classes? Well, the answer is that we just create the object as the compiler would, and we export them. So imagine I have a little JSON file here. Maybe this is a very simple schema. You know, we're building some microservice. It ships events all over the place. Okay, and uh, we have some schema, and we just want to generate classes for all of these message types. And I've got a, this is oversimplified, but it keeps my example nice and simple for now. Okay, it's got a, a name of the event. Okay, and I want to have a class with that name, and I want my class to have these different fields. Now, what I'd really like is to be able to just use some module, okay, and the module is going to read that JSON file, it's going to produce the classes, it's going to export them, and I can then just use them. And just to show you why it's really important that they exist at compile time, 
if I uh, just go to my REPL here and I say class food, okay, and then I say foo.new, it's actually going to complain and say, oh, you used an undeclared name foo there. So we actually want to know these names exist. Okay, so we can't just really cheat here. Um, so let's, uh, let's have a, a look at how we do it. Well, what we're going to do is, uh, first of all, just write a little helper subroutine to uh, create uh, classes. So it's going to get a name, and it's going to get the set of values that we want to have attributes for. And we're going to uh, go off to our meta model, and we're going to take a class that's called a class how. And that is how a class works. Okay, and uh, for all of the various things like grammar, okay, there's a grammar how, role, there's a role how, okay. Um, and uh, what we do with this is we just say, I want to make a new type, and we tell it that the name should be a dollar name. That colon dollar name actually is like passing a name parameter, okay. Uh, so it's like name arrow dollar name, but uh, a nice bit shorter. Now, we're going to sort out the attributes, and then when you actually have finished creating a type, remember I mentioned that the closing curly of a class, that's when we finalize a load of stuff. Okay, what the compiler actually does is it calls compose on the object representing that class. And it's uh, this dot hat thing is actually what we call a meta call. It's a call not on the object itself, okay, but on the meta object. So it's on the object that describes that class. And uh, so we're sort of simulating that, that closing curly. And then we'll do a little loop over the things we want to have as attributes. We'll make a new attribute object, okay? We'll say it's a dollar exclamation mark attribute name. We'll say that uh, we don't care what type of uh, value is stored in there. We'll say that it belongs on the, uh, the package dollar type. Okay, that is the class we're creating, and that we'd like it to have an accessor method generated. And uh, that's all we have to do. Okay, and at the compose, it will uh, actually generate all the accessor methods. So uh, that's, that's how we get a class. Now, next up, okay, we had a little subroutine there. And uh, normally, the way you export things is uh, you put is export on them. Okay, and that, that's it. But because we're being a little more dynamic here, what I'm going to do is just uh, explicitly put myself in the export default package, which is the default things we're going to export. And then I'm going to use the JSON tiny module. I'm going to slurp in a JSON file. Okay, I'm going to from JSON it, which gives me back something. I'm going to actually flat get it as a flattening list. That's the at at the start there. And assign it into this uh, events array. And then I will loop over those. Okay, and uh, this, this thing in the parens here is actually a signature unpack. It means that what we're doing is we're saying, well, I'm looping over an array of hashes, but I don't actually want the hash. I want to pull out the name key and bind it to dollar name, and the values key and bind it to the array values. Okay, so it saves me having to unpack all of the hash. So uh, this is one of the other nice things we do with signatures in Perl 6. Okay, we use them for, for data structure unpacking. <coughs> and then, I generate the class for this name and values. I stick it into the current package, okay, under name, and we're done. And your only question that might remain is, what is that begin thing? Okay. When Perl 6, you can pre-compile modules. You can actually compile them into, say, JVM bytecode, more VM bytecode, and persist it on disk. And that persistence isn't just the code. It's also all of these objects that we create at compile time. What this means is that at the point that you compile this module to bytecode for the first time, okay, and we tend to treat that as a cache, it will go off, it will read the JSON file, it will pass it, it will generate all of these classes. Okay. In the future, when you use that module, it won't have to do all of that anymore. We'll have just saved all the classes that we wrote just as if someone had programmed them by hand in a source file. Okay. So we don't even have to pay the load cost every single time, which is kind of nice. Then you recompile. You you treat it just as you know uh, a, a new version of the module.
Yeah, at, at the moment it happens at module install time. And I'm presuming here this JSON file is something you ship with this little wrapper module. And then when you update to a new version of it, okay, new JSON file, we, pre we recompile it because it's a new version. And uh, yeah, that's the way it would currently be. Okay, I think we have time for one last thing. So if classes and roles are described using objects, what if we could actually sort of, you know, replace those objects or tweak those objects somehow? Maybe that could be kind of interesting. Well, uh, let's imagine we're building ourselves a little MVC framework, okay? And uh, we're, we decided we're gonna put our routing off on the, the controller method, okay? So uh, here I have a, a controller, okay? It inherits from some controller base class. And I've just said, and the URL template for this action is this, okay? And I'm not a web framework designer, so please don't cry too much. Now, um, what I want to do is I would like to sort of statically check that when this framework is used and you write methods in a controller, that you actually use the URL template on all the methods, okay? And if there aren't any, we'd like to tell you at compile time, by the way, you forgot a URL template. Can we do that? Well, uh, here's just a little bit of infrastructure. Okay, there's my controller class. That is the base class for things. Here I've got a role, which uh, just holds uh, a URL template. And here I've got what I, something I call a trait. Okay, you see that is keyword, that, that is there. Okay, you can choose what's going after that. And the way you do it is by, uh, by writing one of these trait mod subroutines. And uh, all I have to do is say what sort of declaration I want to uh, my trait to apply to. So in this case, methods. And uh, then uh, I actually have a choice how I, I arrange for it to be called, but the easy way is just to put a name parameter there matching the trait name. And what actually gets passed to that parameter is whatever value is in the, the parens there, okay? So what I'll then do is I'll just take this role. You can actually use them as mix-ins into individual objects as well. So I'll just mix in to the method, okay, this URL template. And we have this very convenient syntax where if your, uh, your mix-in has only one public attribute and you put something in parens there, we just initialize it with that, okay? It's quite a convenient thing um, that you, you do pretty often. So uh, what I've just done is I've taken my method objects and I've just tacked a little bit of extra information onto it saying, oh, and this is its URL template. So that's how we associate them. How do we check that all the methods have them? Well, what I'm gonna do at this time is turn to a, a special package called export how, okay, which is for exporting uh, meta objects. That is exporting objects that describe how things like classes work. And what I can do is I can say, I want to supersede what class means. And I'm gonna do that by inheriting from the default implementation of classes. And whenever you add a method, okay, I'm gonna intercept that call and I'm gonna do some checking and provided everything is well, I'll do call same, which just means delegate to my base class. Okay, that is do whatever adding a method normally would do. And then in there, okay, I can actually just go and say, well, if this is a controller and if the method isn't, doesn't uh, have a URL template, that is if we didn't mix the URL template role into it, then just die and say, oh, this method lacks a URL template. Okay, and uh, what else? Well, actually that's it. Okay, if I take this and uh, I run it on this code, it comes back to me and it says, hi, this about method lacks a URL template. Oh, gee, so it does, okay. And uh, you can push that even further. You can actually do stuff where you, uh, you get to declare your own kinds of declarators. I wrote a module for uh, monitors, which are a concurrency construct uh, where uh, only one thread is allowed to be inside the object's methods at once. And look at the start of this, okay? Instead of writing class, you write monitor, okay? And then it enforces the mutual exclusion for you, but it gets better because uh, you have these things called condition variables, which basically are conditions you can wait on. So when I'm putting something into the queue, 
I can wait on the condition not full, okay? And when someone takes something from the queue, it can say, oh, now we meet the condition not full. But what's really cute about this is if I uh, was to, uh, if, I just, uh, if I just run this one now, okay, uh, and, uh, okay, and, uh, yeah, it starts working, it runs, okay, blah, blah, blah. But uh, here's the thing I wanted to actually show you. If I go and uh, sort of, you know, not fool instead, okay, that one's a compile time error too, okay? What I've actually been able to do in here is, uh, is actually do a whole bunch of stuff. This, this one's actually more evil because uh, it's not only exporting a custom meta class. Um, actually, you can see that down here. Instead of package supersedes, I say I want to declare a new kind of package, okay, and it's a monitor. Um, you can imagine doing this for your MVC thing where you can have a controller class instead, you know, so it's controller something instead of uh, class something if you really, really want to. Okay, for the concurrency stuff, it's really nice. We have an actual one as well. But uh, I actually wrote macros, which are things that, uh, that run at compile time. So uh, what happens is this, uh, this meet condition, okay, it checks the name, exists, and then it goes and, uh, and actually does the, uh, the getting of the attribute and pulls signal, signal on it, okay, which is the low-level condition variable thing. So... It do, yeah, a macro runs at compile time. So by runtime, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but no, it's about when it runs. So a macro gets chance to say, well, you called me, but actually I want you to compile this bit of code into the program instead. Like yeah, it's just like inlining, just like inlining. Yeah, yeah. So. One of the things that you might be looking at this and saying is, whoa, that's cool, but kind of crazy. Um, and the answer is, well, I don't expect that the everyday user of uh, Perl 6 is going to be you know, going and doing metaprogramming stuff. What I think is really nice, though, is that we're putting into the hands of people who build libraries and frameworks the tools to actually deliver a really nice developer experience. It doesn't matter that in Perl 6, your MVC framework isn't part of the language because you can still find ways to get the compiler to do bits of checking on correct usage. Okay, same with the condition variable thing I do. I think we have a lot of exciting things to explore here. So my time's about up, okay, so just to draw this together. Um, I think for one, in Perl 6, we've made a lot of, uh, I'd say, quite tasteful default trade-offs between static and dynamic where we've said, well, these things, it really makes sense to try and decide as we compile and tell you about, and these, thing, you know, these things really want to be dynamic, and we really want to put them on. One of the things that's also curious is that by actually taking compilation, which is that very static thing, and saying, we're gonna allow a bit of runtime in there, we actually make it a lot more powerful. And kind of almost ironically, it's that very sort of great dynamism where we say even the language itself is mutable. That ironically opens the door to a whole load of really interesting opportunities to do not just the boring static checking, like, oh yeah, you called this method on this object and that object didn't declare it had that method, okay? But a whole lot of much, much more interesting program properties that you really would not like to make it out there into your production environment. So uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, I probably use most of my time, but if I do have any left, I, I don't, I don't. Two, two minutes? Four. four, four, okay. Then I will have four minutes for questions. And if you're at the back, then please make noise instead of just wave your hands because I don't see that far. And it's dark. I don't have anything. Okay, one on the front here. Uh, for the meta model, uh, yeah, actually, Docs Perl Six Org now has pretty good API documentation on meta model stuff. Um, so that that stuff's covered, uh, at least. And I think there's a document now that sort of describes the the big picture stuff of it as well. So so yeah, 
on some of the export stuff, I'm not quite sure what the state of the, the docs are, but uh, if they're not what you want, please say. Um, but the mob stuff, I know a lot of documentation got removed now. I wonder who should write that. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, based on uh, the issue raising uh, Phil Warren earlier, yeah. uh, is there a plan to do a lesser iteration of the Google Weather? <laughs> is, there, uh, is there anything along those lines? Um, it's often enough wrong that I would much rather read it. Uh, it's done with Levenstein, and it has a, a threshold on it. Right. So it has to be pretty close. And we, we actually, I think we even went and tweaked it and started weighting things like, you know, sigils right. um, to decide how they. So it, it has had some tuning. Um, uh, uh, yes, and it, uh, it only does it if your program is actually not going to compile anyway. So yeah, we've we've tried to make it not obtrusive but useful, and I think mostly we have fi people seem to <laughs> to like it. Yeah, okay, that's good, that's good. Please. You, you said there was a, a script that was updated. Is that the um, the herb doc that um, happened to be at Harvard? Some of it, yes. Yeah, is that, that okay? Is that the tool of the Harvard campus? No, no, no. <laughs> the the type analysis bit. I was I was meaning specifically so the you know you called this subroutine with these types. The actual reason that we're doing that analysis is not for um, particularly those cases. The reason we're doing it a lot of the time is because if we've got a load of multi-dispatch candidates um, and you're adding say two native ints together, we actually want to inline the sort of low-level plus operator even though it's defined in a, a multi-sub. Um, so we're actually looking for inlining opportunities and op you know those sorts of things based on the types. And uh, yeah, sometimes it, it just turns out the code you have to write to do that also produces all of the errors for that sort of thing. Most of the rest of it is actually much earlier in the pipeline. So yeah, yeah, one more. Yeah, um, there's a there's an export how um, uh, sub package compose. Um, the idea of compose uh, is that you'll be able to have two modules that both provide instead of uh, cl uh, classes, they provide roles. And what will happen is that the first point you actually try and use the um, the thing will will sort of create a subclass of the currently enforced meta object. We'll compose those roles in that different modules have provided, and then we'll do the normal role composition algorithm on them. Um, and then we'll be able to detect you know, meta-class conflicts. Um, so that, that's the goal. That bit is spec. Um, I didn't get to that one yet, but it's, it's like two hours of programming when I get to catch a break. Um, but OK, and that's my time up. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>